there is very powerful data that neuroinflammation is one of the prime drivers of Alzheimer's disease and actually many neurologic diseases. And I think the most compelling evidence, excuse me, is comes from the um, from the GWAS, the uh, G- genome-wide studies that show that the the cells of the brain with the most genetic or changes in in, in gene being turned on and turned off are the immune cells of the brain. And most people don't know that there are two immune cells of the brain. There's the microglia and the astroglia. And the microglia and the astroglia are 50% of the cells in the brain. That means one half of the cells in your brain are immunologically active. And as you can imagine, if they're not happy, they're up to mischief. And that's exactly what's going on. So if you have activated microglia, activated astroglia, the bad things that happen are quite simple. You kill nerve cells and you disrupt synapses. Now, you're involved in the neurosciences and your audience will understand that nerve cell death and synaptic dysfunction is a key element. In fact, we would propose it is the key two elements of Alzheimer's disease. I like to think of of the brain when it comes to cognition as a personal computer. You've got the hard disk, which is where all the bits and bytes and memory is stored. And that's your nerve cells. That's where your mother's birthday is, right? Then you have the CPU. The CPU is what allows you to capture, to grab all those bits and bytes and all those bits of memories and assemble them in a way that, that comes out as knowledge, right? That's what the synapses do. The synapses connect these uh, nerve cells. They connect the bits and bytes, the memories. They allow you to retrieve your mother's birthday. So if you have dysfunction of that nerve cell or that nerve cell dies, you lose your mother's birthday. You can't get it back. But more importantly, and probably more relevant to therapies, is if you have synaptic dysfunction, your mother's birthday is out there, but you can't access it. And that's because you have synaptic dysfunction. And it turns out synaptic dysfunction is very actively remodeling. It's plastic. In fact, the term they use is plasticity. And if you actually, if you rebuild that synapse, you can actually re-access your mother's birthday. So you can go from not knowing your mother's birthday to knowing your mother's birthday. Now, how do you do that? One of the most important things this, that, that disrupts synaptic function is inflammation. Think of that as a tree. A tree has these big branches. And if suddenly there's a forest fire, the first thing the tree does, is the, it pulls in its arms so to, or its limbs, so to speak, be, and pulls in its limbs and hoping to survive. And when it pulls in its limbs, it loses connections with, with those synapses. So, so, in fact, if you stop neuroinflammation, you stop, destructing, uh, uh, stop the destruction of, of, uh, of synapses. And when you, get, when you renormalize microglia and astroglial function, it helps the nerve rebuild those synapses. So that brings us to the most important point about XPRO-1595, which is our drug. Our drug actually targets TNF and actually targets only soluble TNF. People don't realize that there are two TNFs, and they are a polar opposites. Soluble TNF, which is what everyone wants to get rid of, is the bad TNF. It kills neurons. It disrupts synapses. Transmembrane TNF is essential for normal brain function. It is neuroprotective. It promotes function of the immune system, which in this case is microglia and astroglia, and it promotes remyelination. So it turns out that if you have an, one of the original or the currently approved TNF inhibitors, you block both. So you get rid of the bad, but you get no benefits. Versus X-Pro, you get rid of the bad and you polarize the whole TNF system to rebuilding the nerve system, rebuilding synapses, neurosurvival, and remyelination. And that's the key point. So well, you, 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 what X-Pro does and why it's perfectly designed for treating Alzheimer's disease and other 
other uh, neurologic diseases is that it gets rid of destructive neuroinflammation, but it doesn't, shall we say, completely neutralize, neuter, or destroy the immune system because those microglia and astroglial cells, which are part of the immune system, are essential for remodeling and repair. And if you, if you just kill them, you, you may stop progression of the disease, but you can't help the patient recover from their disease. The advantage of our, our approach is by getting rid of the bad and getting rid of that destructive inflammation. We actually promote what we would call constructive inflammation, which is a bad word. I don't like constructive inflammation because people hear inflammation and they think bad. I would rather say rebuilding and remodeling and repair. We have evidence from our Alzheimer's studies in these patients in the seventh decade of their life that if you get rid of neuroinflammation, the brain can remodel and repair. And in fact, when it remodels and repair, you have cognitive benefits. So we actually believe, believe that, that the brain is not this mysterious, unusual structure. It is mysterious because we still don't know how memories are stored. But it's just like the, you know, it's like a muscle, the liver, you know, you cut it, it can repair itself if you give it the, an opportunity to repair itself. The problem is inflammation, destructive inflammation, neuroinflammation, is bad. It is, it is because of the nature of those fragile synapses and the, and the, and the nature of those mysterious neurons. You know, when you get things, uh, inflammation going on, it causes damage. We stop that. We, prom- we, we set the brain up for remodeling and repair and it'll, and the brain, the cells of the brain are there that can fix them if you give them the tools or the opportunity, and we give them the opportunity. So our drug, we've, we've completed a very successful phase one trial. We've shown three important things uh, in the phase one trial. We've shown that actually we've shown that we can get rid of neuroinflammation in patients with Alzheimer's. And we've shown that there are downstream benefits to getting rid of neuroinflammation. And that's you see axonal regeneration and repair you get synaptic improvement in synaptic function, regeneration, repair. So remember, those are the two pathologies I said were the core of Alzheimer's, nerve cell death and synaptic dysfunction. We fix both. So one of the things that I kind of am bemused about is there are many in the field that have drug development strategies which are targeting cognition but they don't necessarily have evidence that they actually fix, repair synapses or promote nerve cell survival. And the poster child for these are amyloid, anti-amyloid therapies. There is no evidence, as far as I know, or limited evidence that targeting amyloid does anything other than get rid of amyloid. Now, that's great. Get rid of amyloid. The problem is we know both from animal studies and now from a, a huge number of, of, of human studies, the targeting amyloid, well, getting rid of amyloid doesn't have a big effect. So in fact, we believe the, t- the bar needs to be set higher. We believe the minimum that you can ha- have for a successful therapy to Alzheimer's is the drug must stop the disease in its tracks. In other words, if you start a patient on a drug today, five, 10 years from now, they have the same clinical scenario, right? Now, that's a lot different than, than, than currently the expectations of every company. I think we can get there with Expro, with one caveat, which I'll get to in a moment. Now, we have a couple anecdotes of patients who actually got better. There's a caveat. The caveat is you can't treat a patient who has or expect an improvement in a patient with Alzheimer's disease who doesn't have neuroinflammation. What I mean by that is that we believe that there are multiple causes of Alzheimer's disease. It's not all amyloid. As I said, 
neuroinflammation. There's metabolic dysfunction with uh, insulin uh, and, and glucose uh, metabolism. There's problems with uh, mitochondrial function. There's problems with lysosomal uh, function. So if I've got a patient whose primary cause of Alzheimer's disease is lysosomal function, treating them with an anti-inflammatory strategy is nuts, right? So what is our, we think one of the most important innovations we brought to the field is what we call an enrichment strategy. That's an FDA term. What it means is you have inclusion criteria where you actually look at the patient and say, hmm, this patient has neuroinflammation as part of its Alzheimer's and this patient doesn't. And you enroll the patient that has neuroinflammation as part of their Alzheimer's disease, but you don't enroll this patient because you don't expect an effect. And so it turns out that 50% of patients with Alzheimer's disease have evidence of neuroinflammation. So our clinical trials are focused on those 50%. Now, people say, well, you know, what about the other 50%? And I'm like, well, hey, you know, let's fix the first, let's fix the path that we think we can fix. And then we'll worry about the other half. So if we fix the half that we think we can fix, we've made a great advance. And remember, this is the way, this is the modern era of drug development. This is how it's done. If you look at oncology, oncology gets 10 or 15 drugs, new drugs approved a year. CNS gets one if they're lucky. And that's, they do, and they only get one because they use this really, quite frankly, boneheaded approach where they say, I've got to enroll every patient with Alzheimer's disease. I've got to enroll every patient with MS, with ALS, because that's the way it's done. Well, that's not the way it's done. If you look at the way oncology drug development is done, they use enrichment criteria to really narrow the enrollment criteria. And each trial takes a very narrow approach. So they align the drug's mechanism of action with the disease. You don't treat HER2 positive breast cancer the same way you treat ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. And, and that's just the way it's done. And why the CNS drug development fraternity has been so resistant to modernization of, of their clinical development strategies is beyond me. But that's the way we're going. And we know we're going to be successful because of that. In fact, we call Alzheimer's disease in, or, or in patients who have neuroinflammation, ADI, capital A, capital D, small i, because that's what we enroll. It's a subset of patients, and we believe that will be the key to being successful. Match the mechanism of your disease with the pathophysiology of your patient, and if you don't know how to separate that, you're not ready to go into the clinic because you will be guaranteed to fail.